Welcome to the Online Great Books Podcast, brought to you by OnlineGreatBooks.com, where we talk about the good life, the great books, great conversation, and great ideas. I'm Scott Hambrick. And I'm Carl Shoot. Today, on the Online Great Books Podcast, we are going to talk about Robert Heinlein? Heinlein? That's how I said it. Yeah, I say Heinlein. I say Heinlein, too. That's how my dad said it. Well, Joseph's correct. Heinlein's book, Starship Troopers. But before we do that, please just stop. Well, right after I say this thing, stop the podcast. <laughs> right, and go to onlinegreatbooks.com slash podcast and go join our VIP list. And uh, we'll send you some goodies like some notes on how to make notes in a book, how to do dialectic a little digest of our reading list and a whole bunch of other goodies like that. And then when we open enrollment again, once the COVID clears and the smoke clears and uh, shipping is reliable again, we'll give you the first chance at uh, signing up and reading, uh, reading the bigger program with us. We did the plague sessions not too long ago where we read some, some good stuff for fun, Ender's Game and some Woodhouse and uh, a little Walker Percy. But uh, we'll be opening up the, the larger program where we read the heavy hitters. We read the Plato and the Aristotle and the Caesar and stuff like that. So we'd love to have you join us and you can do uh, something that's kind of like what Carl and I do here every week. Mm -hmm. So I was out driving today. I had to run an errand. Mm. Uh, and so I was back in my podcast routine and I, I listened to a few of uh, School Sucks and it was fun. And I listened to An Art of Manliness and it was fun. Mm. So as you get back in motion, hopefully, and you get back into the podcast routine, you can listen to our Music and Ideas podcast. Oh, yeah. Which I finally got set up on my wife's phone so she can hear me talk about other stuff. You see, the thing about the podcast is she finds out really what a smart and interesting guy I am. That's good. <laughs> it's all sanitary and stuff. She doesn't have to actually look at you or touch you. <laughs> she just goes for her walk. She has her headphones on, and she gets to hear me. Yeah. So... This is all about me. When you went out on your errands, did you wear like the plague doctor thing, that weird mask with the beak and the flat brimmed hat? <laughs> yeah. That's good. I have one of those in my closet. I do too. And I fill that beak with comfrey. And then I'll go out <laughs> with the, that staff and buy toilet paper. I've got a friend who works for Kimberly Clark. He was telling me about toilet paper. Did I tell you what he told me about toilet paper? I don't think so. And he said uh, the toilet paper stuff... It's not crazy. All these people buying the toilet paper. It's not, he said it's not crazy. He said about 40% of the toilet paper market is commercial. It's the stuff that your office buys or your school buys or whatever. And he's like, and the corollary to that is people poop at work or at school about 40% of the time. And so they have a different grade of product that goes out to the commercial market. You know, that John Wayne paper, you know? Ugh. And it's and it's marked. You've seen this stuff in different arenas where it says on the package, not for resale. So a lot of that commercial stuff doesn't have barcodes on it. Like Walmart can't do anything with it. It's not set up to go into their system for, you know, stocking and of course checking out. So he's like, you know, there's, since everybody's at home and not at school, the regular retail toilet paper market has 30, 35% more demand in it than it's ever had before. And these factories aren't set up to make that much quilted oh, northern retail product. <laughs> but why can't you just go out and buy a big roll of the Sandy Wipe? The Sandy Wipe. <laughs> because it doesn't have a barcode on it. I was in a store once. At, we're going to get into Starship Troopers in a minute. And this is one of my this is one of my favorite books in the world. But I was in a store once and the computer went out and I wanted to buy something. And I know this is universal now, but when this happened to me way, way back, because I'm old, way, way back in the old days, I was just shocked. Like, mm -hmm. you can't just open the cash register, take my money, give me change, right. and let me leave with the product. No, the computers are down. Right. It's Skynet, you know? If you don't, <laughs> if you cannot track it, if you can't do the little blip thing, we can't do commerce. You can't just yeah. take cash, buy a thing, have somebody write it down on a paper receipt, Seems fragile, doesn't it? Yeah, exactly what I was going to say. Seems fragile that that commerce can't even go if there's a internet outage, or that we can't get perfectly good, if less comforting, toilet paper because it's not packaged correctly. Do you guys in Illinois call it John Wayne paper? 
I just, I told you what we call it. Okay. Have you ever heard it called John Wayne paper? No. We in Oklahoma call it that because it's rough, tough, takes no shit off no man. <laughs> Starship Troopers. Wait, hold on. Oh. <laughs> did you know? Did I tell you that my grandfather was a dead ringer for John Wayne? I've heard that. I think I posted the pictures on the Instagram. What a guy he was. John Wayne or my grand my grandfather? Both of them. But I was thinking John Wayne. I can't hardly talk about John Wayne without crying, so let's move on. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we ought to watch The Quiet Man sometime. Uh, so good. Uh, that uh, John, John Wayne movies I can get on board with. I didn't watch this this crappy Starship Troopers movie. I have. So this is a dear, dear listener. If you think Starship Troopers, wow, I watched that movie and I thought it was cheese and just absolute crap. This book is no good. Well, no, no. Verhoeven, the guy who made the movie for Starship Troopers, made a parody satire of what he thought the book was about. Only I don't know that he read the book. And so he made a parody of a thing that the book isn't. And that's the movie. And the movie's got, it's fun to look at, but it's just silly. And it's not the point of Starship Troopers. So forget the movie existed, or you could hate watch it or watch it ironically like all the the young folks do. But the movie is not the book. This is not like Lord of the Rings where the the movie's just the book softened and, and changed a little bit. The movie Starship Troopers is the book multiplied by minus one. <laughs> Take it for what it's worth. They're not the same thing at all. I looked at some stills from the movie because I'm not going to watch the movie. And they don't have the they don't have the suits, man. Nope. You, you can't even have the movie if you don't have the suits that are in the book. There's an anime version that somebody in Japan did a while back that apparently you can find on YouTube that has the suits. He was a fan of it. I haven't sat down and watched it but apparently the japanese cartoon is a whole lot closer to the book right so if you like mech <laughs> robotech and and like voltron and all of that this is i probably where they came from this is hmm. written i think in 58 something like that yeah that the mechanized be. suit that you wear when you go to war and it's got all the bombs on it and missiles and makes you into a super soldier that's from starship troopers what's this book about <laughs> it's about citizenship hmm. i think you're right is it a science fiction book barely it's set in space it's got space marines so well no technically they're mobile infantry <laughs> but uh you know I'm, I'm a sucker for that kind of thing so spaceships traveling and soldiers dropping to planets and and doing what soldiers do if you like that kind of thing this is it but that's mostly i think that's like the wedding dress but the bride is all about <laughs> citizenship. Yeah, I think so. Which people need to talk about. And and that's why that guy couldn't make that movie. I mean, what it would be difficult to make a movie that sold a lot of tickets that was primarily about citizenship. In the world of Starship Troopers, Terra, there are people that don't live on Earth who are Terrans. That's what they call the members of the nation, right? Uh, humans. That's your planet of origin. In Latin, it's Terra. This is a science fiction trope. They can't just call it Earth. Right. So there are a whole bunch of people in this sort of weird unified government, and they might live on Mars or on Luna, on the moon or wherever, but they're part of this strange country. <laughs> mm -hmm. But very few people are actually citizens. For you to be a citizen in this in this world, you have to have done military service. And military service isn't compulsory either. This is challenging because we have, as an article of faith, universal suffrage. You know, I don't want to get into contemporary stuff, but, you know, you live in the contemporary world, you know, everybody or lots of people are pushing for more people to vote, for lots of people to vote. It doesn't matter if they know anything about the issues. Their voices need to be heard. Everybody needs to vote. This is a very interesting and well-reasoned argument in an entertaining book form against universal suffrage, which really hasn't ever been the ideal. That against universal suffrage has not been an ideal? Universal suffrage has never been the ideal. Right. Yeah, that's new. Except now. And maybe it's right, maybe it's wrong. This book would argue that that's wrong. I have been to Walmart, and as a result, I know it's wrong. <laughs> Do you want to be governed by the people of Walmart? I use that example 
and people get, and I get hate mail about it all the time. <laughs> what is a famous quote that what did Buckley say? He'd rather be governed by the first three pages of the the phone book than the faculty at Harvard. Well, that's fine. Well, gosh, maybe we ought to read Napoleon on Notting Hill someday. Okay. Which is a Chesterton novel. It's like the anti-1984. Mm. I think it's actually set in 1984. It's a science fiction novel that he wrote, which also deals with issues of democracy and who should vote. It might be fun. The first person I saw, the first time I saw a serious treatment of anti-universal suffrage was in uh, Aristotle's Politics. I think it's in book one. He says, women shouldn't vote. Really makes people angry sometimes. Mm -hmm. But it's not for the reasons you think, guys. He says, uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, Carl. He says, one of the main functions of the government is to maintain a military. Militaries have to be hyper-effective, otherwise they lose. He's in the, in the world of uh, bronze swords and shields and hand-to-hand -hand combat. So the military needs to be men only, because if it's comprised of ladies in that fighting environment, that military would certainly not be victorious. And, and then he says, I believe the argument goes like this, the citizens can vote to go to war. Uh, people who aren't in the military don't have skin in the game, and they should not vote to have others go to war. Therefore, the ladies don't get to vote. Yeah. Uh, actually, Jason makes the same argument in Medea. After Medea complains about her her lot in life, it's a very, to modern readers, a very sympathetic complaint. And, you know, everybody likes Medea until she kills her kids. Uh, <laughs> That's what they always say. Oh, she was such a nice lady and so quiet. Who knew? <laughs> so, th so this is like Jason of Jason and the Argonauts, guys. Yeah. We put our bodies at risk to protect you. That's the claim. Okay. In this book, you know, who has responsibility for uh, the city? Maybe we ought to go into the story a little bit because it's unfolded what? in a story. <laughs> there is a story. There's this guy, Juan Rico, Johnny Rico. He's the narrator. He doesn't really say his name very much. Uh, there's lots of, if you like, um, if you like Harry Potter, you might be the sort that likes Tales of Boot Camp. If you liked the beginning, the first episode of Band of Brothers, where you get to see men getting trained. There's all sorts of fun stuff on that. Highland was in the Navy, so he went through whatever their version of it was. Not just the Navy. He went to the Naval Academy and uh, was a serious military man. I mean, not that people that just go in the Navy aren't, but uh, uh, he took this craft. <laughs> well, he wasn't various... in the Air Force. No, right. no, no. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> he took it very seriously. <laughs> I'm sorry. I have not served. I can make no jokes about anybody. I have a friend who's in the Coast Guard. And he's very touchy about the Coast Guard because it's a branch of the military that nobody remembers. I have to continue to qualify what I said there. When I say he took it very seriously, anybody that gets in the military is taking it pretty seriously. But I think having gone to the Naval Academy and being the sort of guy he was, he thought very deeply about just war, uh, citizenship, um, who's, who's it appropriate to have even be a soldier, because uh, not everybody should be a soldier, I think, in Heinlein's mind and in his world. He paints here in Starship Troopers, and, and it all comes out there. He's very thoughtful about the whole art of war, I think. Mm -hmm. We went to the to the Missouri Museum of Military History a few years back. It was a, it was a formative moment for Carl. It, well, I got to hold a musket, so that was a big deal. But I forget if he was a major or a colonel. The guy who was running the museum happened to be from the town that's just north of me. It was like old home week, you know, Joe, do you remember the, this place over? Yeah, I remember that place. So we were having a good time and I had my kids there and he was talking to my children about what it took to be a soldier. And he went through the disqualifying things. And it turns out that I forget his exact number, but of, of the general population, a very small percentage could even qualify to be a modern soldier. Yep. And of that, how many of them sign up? This is like, if you go to the Republic, only certain kind of people can be the guardians because, well, what's the point of an army? To kill people and break things. Yeah, it's the application, or as uh, one of the characters say here, what is it? Violence solves everything. That's on page 27. Violence, naked force has settled more issues in history than has any other factor, and the contrary opinion is wishful thinking at its worst. Our friend, the professor at Student of the Gun Radio... 
he says fighting solves everything. Well, it, if you think it doesn't, why is chattel slavery no longer allowed in these United States? Because a bunch of people died. Did the North win a moral argument or did they win the war? They won a war. Why is Nazism not currently active in Europe as a governmental system and other repressive totalitarian regimes are still around? Why are they gone? Because of force. Yeah. It's force. I got you off of the story. Sorry about that. Yeah. Johnny Rico. Sorry. He's from a very wealthy family. His dad owns um, some large business concerns. They never really go into what those are. I don't know. But he's graduating from high school, and the dad has a plan that the young man is eventually going to end up running those businesses, and then it's an enormous opportunity for him, and it's going to be great. And Johnny has a good friend who wants to join the military. He doesn't have the kind of prospects that Johnny does. And by golly, he just goes down and enlists one day. Then they go to basic training. He got to put in a list of jobs that he would like to have in the military. And the last one he picked was mobile infantry. He wasn't qualified to do his first 22 choices or whatever it was. (laughs) Uh, But they sent him to school to actually be in the mobile infantry, which is probably something like uh, being an airborne ranger. They don't jump with parachutes. They... They're shot out of a torpedo tube from a spaceship in this capsule down onto uh, uh, uh-huh. the surfaces of planets and bring war to the enemy. Yeah. Dear listener, if you've ever played the Halo games. Oh, yeah. Master Chief gets shot out of these spaceships in a capsule. It's Starship Troopers. Yeah. Okay. Why does he join the mobile infantry? It's Carmen. Right. Yeah. There was a girl. Uh, all the All the finest pilots are ladies. In this in this universe, you know, they've got those fine mm-hmm. motor skills. They can take more G's than men, and uh, that's true. And all the finest pilots are ladies. And there's this f- a school friend, Carmen, who's very attractive, uh, real good with math, and she goes down to and signs up that day to uh, become a pilot. And uh, that's all that uh, Johnny needed to kick him over the edge, really, and he signs up too. And they have a 48-hour waiting period. The recruiter says, if you come back, or if you never show up, it's fine. You sign these papers, yeah. but if you don't show up, that's fine. Because if you don't want it, we don't want you. And that's the first instance where you see where you see how selective the military is. And the military in this world is e- extraordinarily selective for two reasons, at least two reasons. One, they want to be the best at killing people and breaking things. Because they know the stakes if you suck at that. And two, if you make it through, you get to vote. And they only yeah. want the finest, most virtuous people who understand the consequences of being the member, a member of a polis. That's a very, very fine sieve they run people through. Well, so I want to give a quote. So he's in getting his medical exam. He thinks that the doctor is... A military man, but he's not. And there's a quote on 32. uh, Military services for ants. Believe me, I see him go. I see him come back. When they do come back, I see what it's done to them. And for what? A purely nominal political privilege that pays not one centavo and that most of them aren't competent to use wisely. Anyhow, this is what the civilian thinks of voting. It's no big deal. It's a nominal privilege. It doesn't add any cash. Right. What's the point of doing it? Now, Johnny has, in his high school, he has a wonderful class, a very interesting class called History and Moral Philosophy, which is really, I think, the the fun part of the book is listening to Dubois, Mr. Dubois, talk about history and moral philosophy. That's the the real fun of the book. It's a little... uh vehicle that Heinlein uses to slip his heavy duty philosophy into this otherwise kind of fluffy book. Uh, Because without it, it would be fluffy, but it's fun. He makes it fun. He makes the medicine go down good. I don't know that it's so fluffy. If you don't have the philosophy part, Carl, it's just to shoot him up. Well, no, it's also a tale of like heroism. I have highlighted. Okay. fair, Fair enough. You know, these people, they're in an existential battle, but they're in a battle with the bugs. Some, alien hive mind insect like creature that seems to want their total destruction. Yeah, if they don't win this war there will be no more humans. It's cool. right. So it's a serious thing. 
but in the beginning of the book, there's a tale of heroism of of rescuing a soldier who had been injured, and they go through all sorts of effort to get him. And then the last line of the chapter is, Flores died on the way up. I have not served. I've read a fair amount of military history. This stuff chokes me up. These people, these very fine people. I know this is fiction. These are not real people. But these people that are willing to go and put their bodies on the line for what they judge to be the safety of us mm-hmm. is real impressive. We we have a fine friend, Nick Coldaway, who has been in the military, and he's written... <laughs> He's been he's been writing some essays about his uh, experiences there, and he's put a couple of them on my blog, <laughs> just so mm-hmm. just so they get out there. You know, he's got, he, I think he's got one kid. And he's going to have more, and they need to be published. You just read about the stuff that these people do, and it's well, it's not okay. <laughs> I wish they didn't have to do that. I wish they didn't have to do that. But that there are the sorts of people who are capable and willing to do these sorts of things is amazing and humbling. Somebody you and I both know has the Bronze Star. I never knew. He never mentioned it. Right. You're happy you have them in your city. You're happy that you have them in your country. Particularly if they take a class like history and moral philosophy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so when they're pulling the trigger, they know precisely why they're doing it. The, the screening process in Heinlein's world here isn't just about can the person do the push-ups and do the ruck. It's also are their motivations correct? Adrenaline junkies need not apply here. Mm -hmm. It's not just that. You know, I want to jump out of parachutes and I have this machismo. They have to have the right moral underpinnings because, because it's not just about being an effective fighting force. It's also about being a citizen. And those citizens need to be motivated correctly. So in the history and moral philosophy class, it's on page 27 in my book, one girl told Mr. Dubois bluntly, my mother says that violence never settles anything. (laughs) <laughs> so, Mr. Dubois looked at her bleakly. I'm sure that the city fathers of Carthage would be glad to know that. Why doesn't your mother tell them so? Or or why don't you? Cicero famously, like every time he spoke to the Senate, would say, and well, Carthage, Cato. Oh, Cato, yeah. yeah. And Carthage must be destroyed. <laughs> every time. Um, then the book goes on and says, They had tangled before. Since you couldn't flunk the course, it wasn't necessary to keep Mr. Dubois buttered up. She said shrilly, You're making fun of me. Everybody knows that Carthage was destroyed. He says, You seem to be unaware of it, he said grimly. Since you do know it, wouldn't you say that violence had settled their destinies rather thoroughly? However, I was not making fun of you personally. I was heaping scorn on an inexcusably silly idea, a practice I shall always follow. Anyone who clings to the the historically untrue and thoroughly immoral doctrine that violence never settles anything. I would advise to conjure up the ghost of Napoleon Bonaparte and of the Duke of Wellington and let them debate it. The ghost of Hitler could referee, and the jury might well be the dodo, the great auk, and the passenger pigeon. Here's the money shot. Violence, naked force, has settled more issues in history than has any other factor, and the contrary opinion is wishful thinking at its worst. Breeds that forget this basic truth have always paid for it with their lives and freedoms. But, you know, there's no Carthaginians anymore. Or dodos, or great ox, or <laughs> passenger pigeons. You know, I, I like that he throws in the the animals there, because he lets us know that, you know, we're kind of part of this nature thing, too. The fact that violence does settle things as a basis in physics. <laughs> it's what politics is, right? It's the application of violence. I, I'm sorry. I, I, this might be hard. I might get some letters. Send them to where they send the, the hate mail. Gates at Microsoft.com. <laughs> it's hard to think about. And it's so true once you think about it. It settles everything. This is what politics is. Uh, if you go driving, you must drive on the right side of the road. Why? Because the popo will make you do it. If you don't drive on the right side of the road, they will pull you over. What if you don't want to be pulled over? They will make you pull over. (laughs) How will they make you pull over? They will wreck your car or kill you. Yeah. If you choose not to pay your taxes, there will be, that was a knock on the door. They will make you pay your taxes. How will they ultimately make you pay your taxes? Well, first they'll shoot your dog. (sighs) (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah, I know what you're talking about. I mean, 
all of these laws, every time everybody proposes a law, if you, if you have friends on, on the so-called social media, which maybe we should do some social media distancing, mm. but a whole lot of people saying, well, this should be a law or we should do this or, or this should be mandatory. You should step back and think, for this to be mandatory means that there will be violence done to those who do not do it. And it means that you will need people to deal out that violence. And maybe it doesn't come to that. Maybe you just get the sternly worded letter from the, the three-letter agency and you comply. But if you didn't, violence is going to settle your difference of opinion. And that's just the way every government has ever worked. Is, yeah. Am I wrong? I, I wish I was. And if they're really, really effective, you don't ever have to see the violence very much. It just lays underneath there and uh, the gun in the room is hidden because everybody's compliant. It doesn't need to be so stark. I mean, if you have a strong culture that goes along with the laws that you, your nation has deemed to be good, then nobody really wants to break them anyway. Right. You know, I don't want to drive on the left side of the road because it's dangerous. It's better that we all drive on one side of the road. By convention, you don't need to convince me. You don't need to use violence on me. So do laws follow convention or do does convention follow the law then? <laughs> Uh, well, you know, it's like they said in the Simpsons, if something is no longer illegal, it's no longer immoral. <laughs> right. Now that's a big question that, that goes into to what makes a law. Um, I was thinking as we're getting into this, boy, this is such a fun book to read, but I was thinking about the definition of law and I got Aquinas's definition rolling around in my head. And I, I remember there's five parts. I'm probably going to miss one. It's an ordinance of reason promulgated for the common good by the sovereign power. Right. So there's some loaded words in there. The common good, that requires some figuring. And the sovereign power, who's the sovereign power? In the sovereign power, the way Aquinas says it, is he who has care for the community. He says a lot about that. And they also have to actually be able to enforce the law. Part of that care is the ability to actually <laughs> uh, punish and hurt. I like the promulgation part. You have to actually post it. Yeah, you can't have secret laws. Unlike 19, the book 1984. Well, that was the first thing that the Romans did was have the law codes on the tablets in the in this town square. I like that. Or the Code of Hammurabi. We have a copy of it in Chicago at the Oriental Institute. You can go look at it. One of the earliest law codes. It was just carved on a big rock. Is it coming back? The Code of Hammurabi? Mm-hmm. I, I can't actually remember the details of it. Something about like if 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 I build a house and it falls down on somebody, then I get killed. I think that's part of the code. Yeah, you get killed in a house collapse. I, <laughs> I believe <laughs> some it's the, you know if you've heard of eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, that's the code of Hammurabi. It's still a code, you know. All right, I want to read just a little bit. One paragraph later from the thing you said. So mm. Dubois, who's who's got his arm missing, by the way. So he's been wounded, apparently. Apparently he was a soldier. <laughs> and he, after he talks to the young lady, another year, another class, and for me, another failure. One can lead a child to knowledge, but one cannot make him think. Suddenly, he pointed his stump at me. You, what is the moral difference, if any, between the soldier and the civilian? And he says, the difference lies in the field of civic virtue. A soldier accepts personal responsibility for the safety of the body politic of which he is a member, defending it, if need be, with his life. The civilian does not. Now, here's an interesting part. Dubois says the exact words of the book. But do you understand it? Do you believe it? It's one thing to talk about civic virtue and taking responsibility for the body that you're a member of. Do you do any of it? If the aliens are advancing, do you put your body between your fellow citizens and the aliens or not? That would be the difference in this book between those who eventually get the right to vote and those who don't. To Johnny's credit, he says, uh, I don't know, sir. Yeah, that's a good answer. He doesn't fudge and he doesn't make anything up. Johnny's an honest guy. Not too bright, though. Can't do math. <laughs> hey, hey now, damn it. But he goes down and uh, he enlists. You get to be privy to a little bit of his internal dialogue. And you'll, you'll see that he doesn't have a bunch of high-minded reasons for doing this. He's not thinking about what Dubois taught him about 
being to lay his body down bef- in protection of the body politic. He, he's not thinking that stuff. Some of it is he just is in defiance of the family. Mm-hmm. They have this course set out for him, and he would like to make his own way. And this is one way that he might possibly do that. And it's right in front of him. But he's not high-minded. But this military is highly competent, and they're able to they're able to take him on and find the right place for him and uh, and and also to educate him in the ways of the proper use of force and and get him to be a just soldier and that all starts that all starts when they swear the guy in page 34 in mine page 34 hmm. I swear to uphold and to defend the Constitution of the Federation against all its enemies on or off terra to protect and defend the constitutional liberties and privileges of all citizens and lawful residents. Such duties of any lawful nature as may be assigned to me by lawful direct or delegated authority. And I want to read the end. And on being honorably discharged at the completion of my full term of active service or upon being placed on inactive retired status after having completed said full term to carry out all duties and obligations and to enjoy all privileges of Federation citizenship, including but not limited to duty, obligation and privilege of exercising sovereign franchise for the rest of my natural life unless stripped of honor by verdict finally sustained of court of my sovereign peers. So... When you get done, but not during, when you get done, you get to vote. But it's not you get to vote. I really like how this is framed here, that voting, it's not so much hearing your voice. It's a duty. And we've talked about this before. You know, does it really make economic sense to get in the car and go vote? Well, no, you can sketch it out so it doesn't, you know, it costs $2 worth of gasoline and you got to get up. And if you live in a, a, a non-swing state, what difference does it make? But then again, if you take your citizenship seriously, maybe you better ought to go because there's plenty of people who don't take it seriously. Hmm. Framing it as an obligation Duties and obligations, the obligation and privilege of exercising sovereign franchise. If we lived under a monarchy, the only person who has the duty and privilege of exercising sovereign franchise would be the king. Right. It'd be his job to take charge of the good of all of us. And if he were a bad king, it would be him not voting. Does that make sense? Am I convincing you? Oh, well, I'm convinced, but there has to be some caveats there. The government needs to take that franchise very seriously as well. Oh, sure. It'll be hard to not get political here, but if they give that franchise to anybody that can can walk a certain distance from any other place on the globe, what are we doing? What What is it? Yeah, I, I remember reading somewhere that in almost every presidential election, certainly since the invention of the telescreen, that the taller candidate has won, right. at least in presidential elections. Why? There has been no elected bald president since the advent of television. Right. So you can bring up Eisenhower. Well, no, there wasn't really television. And Ford only got in because Nixon got out. <laughs> right. So I'm just looking at you, Scott, and I'm thinking, you are presidential material. 6'2", got all my hairs. I could never do it. My hair is on the wrong side of my head. The reason for bringing that up, I mean, that shows you that the sovereign privilege and duty of voting is not taken seriously by a lot of people, or they're not aware of the manipulation and propaganda. They need a history and um, what's the name of the course? History and moral philosophy. Yeah, they need a history and moral philosophy course. Yeah. You know, it's like Sayer said in that Lost Tools of Learning, uh, everybody complains about nobody being able to think very well right now. But that's by design, she suspects. And it makes it hard for me to get excited about voting when they're just going to vote for the tallest one Mm. or uh, they're so perifics or whatever, and nobody's thinking about anything. It's really tough. So the the world here of uh, the Federation is mighty appealing to me. Mm -hmm. They cart him off to Camp Curry, uh, where you have a uh, full metal jacket style uh, episode here where we talk about basic training, which is really, really great. It's really great. It's a lot of fun. Uh, I think I enjoyed that piece. He said, I made a very important discovery at Camp Curry. Happiness consists in getting enough sleep. Just that, <laughs> nothing more. 
I had a, an old bishop told me once that happiness consisted of regularity. <laughs> he may be right, but I've always been regular, so I'm not sure. <laughs> well, I, <laughs> I'm suffering in, in several areas, including the sleep, so that, that's probably why I'm, I'm not as happy as I could be. I read there next to the sleep comment that it's certainly a prerequisite, you know? Like, I don't know that it, happiness consists of a good sleep, but if you don't have it, boy, it sure is tough. You know, I knew I knew an army guy back in my days. This is a long time ago. Gosh, he was a he was a Catholic seminarian. He had served in the army, and then he went into it. And you'd look at him in church, and he'd be sleeping. Oh yeah, but he'd be standing. Yep, he could sleep standing up, which I think. That might be the most important skill you could ever learn, <laughs> to sleep with your eyes open like Gandalf and Zoom meetings that you didn't really want to be in, but you had to be in. My dad's a retired career military guy. He retired as an E-9. He was in the Army for 13 years and then the Air Force for the rest of his career, which is odd, but that's what he did. Dad would come home and watch Carson and then go to bed. So what is that, 11? He'd watch the monologue and maybe mm -hmm. a little bit of Rickles when he came on or whatever, you know. And then he'd go to bed, and then he would roll out about 4.45 or 5 in he, a.m. And so so that's around six hours of sleep. He did that for about almost 40 years. I would have died. Dad says, never stand when you can sit, never sit when you can lay down, never lay down when you can go to sleep. Yeah, that's yeah. rules for life. Yeah. yeah. I like the sergeant, Sergeant Zim. You should help me. Why are boot camp stories so much fun i don't know well you know drill instructors i think since roman times or spartan times i guess they have a mystique about them because they have such authority in the boot camp that you just don't see anywhere else it's otherworldly and they have they have authority in two ways uh, they can kick the shit out of you if they want to mm -hmm. and then they know what they're doing so in that realm, you're dealing with a person who has the ability to do whatever they need to to you, not what they want, right? What they need to to you. And they're also completely competent in that arena. And we just never see that somewhere. You know, you just don't see that very often. So it's really strange. And then the drill instructors, since the days of the hoplite, have always had this weird sense of humor. So there's been something <laughs> funny and fun and absurd about basic training. For as long as we've known about it. That centurion in the Bible, I wonder if he was like Zim. Whoever trained him was. There he is cussing out his soldiers, and, and he says to Jesus, I too am a man in authority. And when I say jump, you know, the, the whole line of that parable is he knows what it's like to be told to do stuff and have to do it. And then says to Jesus, all you have to do is say he's healed and he's healed. I think the Bible's hilarious sometimes, but it makes Jesus out to be a divine drill sergeant. <laughs> it's it's right. in there. I'm not making it up. I right. mean, some some of the dear listeners will probably correct me. We have some... Both kinds of authority. Theologically erudite listeners who will correct me on that. Jesus says drill sergeant. That would be a good t-shirt. <laughs> Jesus is my DI. <laughs> I got in trouble at school one time. No. Real bad. And it was an ongoing thing. The statute of limitations is up, but I'll never tell the story publicly. I'll tell you when we're in a room <laughs> together sometime. We'll go out and stand in the middle of a wheat field. We'll put our phones in a refrigerator. We'll stand in the middle of a wheat field, and I'll whisper it in your ear. Uh, but the principal called my dad at work, and my dad said, I'll be right there. And the principal hung up. Of course, I couldn't hear my dad's end of the conversation. I'm sitting in the principal's office, and the principal hung up and said, your dad's going to be right here. In principal's office was on the second floor of the school, and I looked out the window, and I saw Dad pull up in a Humvee with, like, one tire on top of the curb <laughs> and three tires in the street. He got out. He left it running when the, wind, the door opened. And I'm like, oh, Jesus. It took, I don't know, 41 seconds, and he walked in the principal's office, and he said, I never call you at your job to ask you how to do my fucking job. <laughs> don't ever call me again. Do your job. Then he turned to me, and he says, We'll take care of this when I get home. And he turned around and he walked back out. Wow. And I saw him go back out of the building and get in that truck, shut the door and leave. <laughs> what did the, what did the principal do? You know what? I don't even remember. I think he, I think he whooped me. 
I think he gave me a bunch of SWATs and then assigned me this and D Hall and I thought all this kind of shit. I don't I, I don't even remember. But that principal, he had a gold anchor on his front tooth. Hmm. And he also had this tattoo on his hand. And my uncle Richard had that same tattoo. And I asked my uncle Richard, I said, Where'd you get that? And he said, Well, I got that in a juvenile detention center in Salt Lake City, Utah. Wow. <laughs> and I told the and so I told that principal in the co- course of all this stuff, I said, hey, uh, when you were in juvenile detention, did they make you join the Navy? He hated me from then on. <laughs> oh, gosh. But I know that's what happened. Oh, God, he hated me. Me and him had it out for each other. It was a delight. <laughs> but anyway, the, these NCOs have got a certain way about trying to get, you know, making people do what they're supposed to do and fill their role and do it reliably. And that's what dad did. <laughs> You know, I have a tendency towards sloppiness and laziness. Uh, if I had the light on, you would see it behind me here in my bunker. It's like a psychological pleasure to imagine somebody competent taking over for your willpower and getting more out of you than you thought you had. Mm. You're like secretly thinking, wouldn't it be great to have done this boot camp thing? I don't want to do it, but wouldn't it be great <laughs> right. to- to have it done, <laughs> I think that might be some of the the attraction of it because we all know that we fall short in these personal virtues. What do you think? It, like it's some kind of displacement. I'm Johnny Rico getting shaped mm. up. And there are coming of age stories too. The young man comes in one way. There's a trial, and he comes out mm-hmm. a fully fledged, you know, soldier. He's a man now. Well, we love these sort of stories. I, and I, I was joking a little bit, bringing up Harry Potter. Hogwarts is not boot camp because Hogwarts is very sloppily run. It's the most dangerous place in that universe. But uh, it's the same kind of thing. How are these kids going to grow up? There's a little bit different in that they're subverting it. You know, there's kind of a joy in stories where you get round the wicked headmaster. Mm-hmm. But there's also a joy in the stories where the sergeant or headmaster is actually really competent. And what happens is the character grows and becomes like them. It's two different ways of, of running the same kind of story. My dad, I was sitting in his shop with him one night and he pulled out this little stenographer's pad and I need to find this. I need to find this pad. And I don't know. I need to ask him about it. And he had written a poem about his drill instructor in Fort Polk, Louisiana in 1966. And he read the thing to me. And I I can't remember what the particulars were. But the beats of it were, there was a kindness in his cruelty. He was willing to do whatever it took to teach them how to not get killed. There's a very difficult set of decisions that someone who's training people to go into danger has to make about what lengths do I need to go to what dangers do I need to put them in right now so that they will be safer later? And th- those guys hold that in the, in their hand the whole time. And then and he told me, he put the thing, he read it, whatever it was, and, and, uh, and he put it down and he said, you know, he just, he, he realized pretty early on in basic training that the drill instructor, you know, while they might go on an eight mile run or whatever the heck it was, that the drill instructor was running with them screaming at them and then running around their formation. Hmm. So if the men ran eight miles, he ran 12 and never lost the the crease in his trousers or visibly even sweat. And he talks about Zim, Sergeant Zim being the same way here in this, uh, in in this story. He talks about the crease in his trousers is always perfect. And it's great. Yeah. I want to read a, a little bit on 54. I may have given the impression that boot camp was made harder than necessary. This is not correct. It was made as hard as possible and on purpose. It was the firm opinion of every recruit that this was sheer meanness, calculated sadism, fiendish delight of witless morons in making other people suffer. It was not. It was too scheduled, too intellectual, too efficiently and impersonally organized to be cruelty for the sick pleasure of cruelty. It was planned like surgery for purposes as unimpassioned as those of a surgeon. Oh, I admit that some of the instructors may have enjoyed it, but I don't know that they did. And I do know now that the psych officers tried to weed out any bullies in selecting instructors. They looked for skilled and dedicated craftsmen to follow the art of making things as tough as possible for a recruit. So it's not bullies. It's hard on purpose because uh, they need it to be hard. My dad was in the army for a little while. He tells me that the coldest he ever was in his life was at Fort Sill mm-hmm. in Oklahoma. There's not a tree between Fort Sill and the Arctic Circle. 
<laughs> and the no. winter, it all just comes right down there, 42 miles an hour. You know, you read about this. I mentioned Band of Brothers, which is a, a wonderful little movie series about one particular group of soldiers at D-Day who were paratroopers, which was a new thing at the time, a pretty new thing. And they asked, some of these, some of these guys were still alive when they filmed it. And so each episode starts out with interviews with the surviving members. Well, why'd you sign up to be a paratrooper? Well, it was 50 extra dollars a week. But also, You're the best. it was hard. And if you're going to be sent into a war, you want to be next to the very best people you possibly can. They wanted it hard. The harder, the better. Uh, we used to play bridge with this couple that were um, World War II age. They're, bo they're both gone now. But Tom, Tom in uh, 1941, December 8th, went down and signed up to be in the Marines. And I said, well, why the Marines, Tom? And he said, because they were the best. I didn't want to be some goddamn cookie pusher, is what he said. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he ended up in the 2nd Marine Division, and he did five amphibious landings under fire. Oh, gosh. Tarawa, Tinian, Saipan. Uh, I think he was in Okinawa and Iwo Jima. I think it was, maybe it wasn't Iwo Jima. You can go look it up. He was in the 2nd Infantry, Infantry Division and uh, um, saw it all. They, and he did it because they were the finest. And that, that's why a lot of these guys uh, joined the mobile infantry here. Yeah, my goodness. I'm sorry. I'm just thinking of an old lady that I used to know who had a kid that died at Okinawa. She couldn't remember last week, but she'd have fresh tears about her son. Mm -hmm. You know, every time you talk to her, just she's just reliving it. Uh, goodness. Let's see. The, uh, one more quote. The prime purpose was of making as sure as was humanly possible that no cap trooper ever climbed into a capsule for a combat drop unless he was prepared for it, fit, resolute, disciplined, and skilled. And I think a lot of this is based on paratroopers. If you get to the airplane, they do all the training. If you get in the airplane and you refuse to jump, you're out. It just is not for you. You know, nobody knows if you're capable of jumping out of an airplane that's not on fire until you have to jump out of an airplane. It's very interesting uh, for me, the, the non-military person, the, the, to get a view of, of what this sort of thing is that these people do. Uh, a whole lot of voluntary hardship. Guadalcanal, Tarawa, Saipan, Tinian, in Okinawa. Wow. Yep, did them all. Zim isn't just a drill sergeant, though. He's a teacher and he's a philosopher. Mm -hmm. He tells Johnny at one time, you've got it all wrong, son. There's no such thing as a dangerous weapon. There are no dangerous weapons. There are only dangerous men. I think that's important. Do you think Heinlein's thinking about the Republic at all with these philosopher warriors? I think so. That I mean, the, the philosopher king comes out of the Guardian class. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's Republic with Space Marines. I do too. On war, uh, page 65, Dubois, I believe, he says, uh, there could be circumstances when it's just as foolish to hit an enemy city with an H-bomb as it would be to spank a baby with an axe. War is not violence and killing pure and simple. War is controlled violence for a purpose. The purpose of war is to support your government's decisions by force. The purpose is never to kill the enemy just to be killing him, but to make him do what you want him to do, not killing, but controlled and purposeful vi violence. But it's not your business or mine to decide the purpose of, of the control. It's never a soldier's business to decide when or where or how or why he fights. That belongs to the statesmen and the generals. The statesmen decide why and how much. The generals take it from there and tell us where and when and how. We supply the violence. Keep going. Other people. Other people. Older and wiser heads, as they say, supply the control, which is as it should be. And here in the Heinlein universe, these older and wiser heads, because of the way the franchise is set up, would have had military experience and have been in closer contact with violence and its consequences than the female senator from uh, Fredonia who has not done any of these things but can't get enough Middle Eastern wars. Uh-oh, did I do that? <laughs> Our female senator is missing her legs from having been in the, I think, Afghanistan, maybe Iraq. Makes a difference. I wish that hadn't happened to her, but she knows something more about it than the neocon warhawk that can't get enough. I'm reading this thinking, my gosh, if, if if I ever had the misfortune to be elected to Congress, how scared I would be 
this is not chess pieces on a table. Every decision you make, think about this, every governmental decision you make is enforced by violence. Every time you say, let's send troops over there, it's obvious. But I mean, everything you do is... Yeah, raise the millage rate on property tax. Whoever doesn't pay that can't live there no more. And the sheriff brings a gun and makes them leave. And maybe it's the right thing to do. Sure. Okay. We got to have laws. We got to have policies. We have to have an ordered society for sure. But heavy hangs the head that wears the crown. And that's you. Boy, realize what you're doing. And, and don't just say, well, let's make new laws. Let's, let's make this illegal. Let's make... No, what you're saying is let's apply violence to people. Every time you do that, that's what you should think that you're saying. And then you have to do the other intellectual question of, is this justified violence that I am proposing when I'm saying, let's uh, make mandatory school attendance or something like that? You know, right. is it justified? And if you can answer yes, well, then maybe you ought to do it. But you shouldn't ever delude yourself into thinking that government is not controlled application of violence. I don't know. Did I say too much of what I think? No. no, I don't think so. Say what you think. Heinlein is such a good writer. He's writing about the recruits eventually get to put on their mech, their armor. <laughs> Do you want it's a mech? A, uh, yes. It's an exoskeleton, and they wear this thing, and it's 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 armored. It also has some, you know, uh, climate control and respiratory. You know, it's a space suit too. And then when they wear that thing, they can jump really high and run really fast, and they're really strong. Mm. And it's I want one so bad. It's super cool, and it's got rocket launchers and ammo and all kinds of stuff on it. And this is why Highland's so good. He says, uh, in general, powered armor doesn't require practice; it simply does it for you, just the way you were doing it, only better. All but one thing: you can't scratch where it itches. <laughs> if I ever find a seat that will let me scratch between my shoulder blades, I'll marry it. You know. <laughs> How did Heinlein, when he was thinking of this, uh, the, of the powered suit, was he thinking of uh, wearing some sort of a, a, a backpack frame or something, a, an Alice pack or something when he was in mil the military and couldn't scratch his back? Like, how did he know to write about that very basic experience that a soldier would have had wearing that suit? Like, I think that's the mark of a great writer that he made it that personal and that granular, you know? I remember reading a comment, I think that he did about writing, or it was a comment about his writing, how you add this sort of atmosphere to a book. And it was rather than saying the door opened, you say the door dilated. <laughs> and you've immediately set the scene that everything's different. You know, that he's, I don't know how many people read Heinlein anymore. He's got some really good books and a lot of fun stories and a couple of weird ones, but he certainly is excellent. Um, it's worth your time if you're looking for something to read. One of my favorite words is grok, mm. which comes from stranger in a strange land. What does it mean? It means to understand and to like eat. To, like to deeply take something <laughs> in and understand it somehow. But it also means to eat. All right. And it might mean to have relations with. Yeah, like we grasp concepts. They eat, grab, take them. <laughs> when they grok, I don't know. <laughs> in basic training, a guy hits Sergeant Zim. And this may be the best part of the book, Carl. Tell me why. Because you get to see behind the curtain. Okay. Zim, Zim is a stoic uh, military machine to all the recruits, all the, all the boots. He pushes a guy a little too far, and the guy jumps up and punches him right in the eye. Well, we don't know that yet. <laughs> that comes out later. So Hendrick is the soldier, and they are given the order to freeze, which is one of these if you're in the mobile infantry and they tell you to freeze, you stop, you drop and you freeze. You don't do anything. And Hendrick is laying on an anthill. And so he's got ants crawling in him and he doesn't want to freeze. They're biting him. Yeah. Zim comes up and hits him with the baton, I think. But he gets brought to the company commander, to Captain Frankel, for disobeying orders. And so they're going to give him bread and water, uh, three extra hours of duty, 10 hours of extra duty on Sunday. A big punishment, but doable. An administrative punishment, I think is what they call it. Mm -hmm. And then Hendrick, the moron, he doesn't realize what's going on. Because he, he, he struck back, but Zim hasn't said that he did. Zim is covering for him. 
and the idiot's too dumb to realize that he's being covered for. He's like, don't you want to hear my side of the story? And the commander knows he's covering for him, too. He knows something's up, and he's like, we don't care about your side of the story. You were told to freeze, and you didn't freeze. You know, you get to go peel potatoes now. And he's like, I demand to be heard, and he tells the story, and he's like, and, I, and he hit me with that baton, and I turned around, and I socked him. And the commander, mm. you can just imagine, and he's just like, oh, you stupid son of a bitch. Because every Sunday they post the articles, was it 32 items that can uh, sink your ship? Mm-hmm. And one of them is striking a superior, and he's done it. And uh, they have to call a court martial at this point, and they've got to go all the way. Yeah, they could have killed him. And the idiot didn't realize it. This thing that he'd said every Sunday, he was just so caught up in the, um, the moment and wanting to justify himself, but not realizing the greater principle that he'd violated, which there's a nice little thing in there on, on morality. You know, like you get this when you do the ethics, Aristotle's ethics, how is it that you go wrong when you know that you shouldn't do something, but yet you do it because our perceptions make the thing that's close to us seem bigger and the abstract general principle seem farther away. This is like, I got hit. I'm going to hit back. Right. Well, you forget the thing that you learned, which is don't strike your sergeant. So he's in big trouble. They could have killed him. They don't, they give him, what is it? 10 lashes, 10 lashes, just like the British Navy, like in one of the old hornblower books. Well, actually they chain him to a post and they have the special shirt on that they can take off. (laughs) I mean, even though he's chained, they give him 10 lashes. And they send him right out of the military. Mm -hmm. They make everyone watch. And uh, Johnny watches. And I think he sees three lashes. And then he wakes up. (laughs) A a whole bunch of guys passed out just watching. Yeah. And and, and then later on, a guy named Dillinger had gone AWOL. In the mobile infantry, they really don't care if you go AWOL as a recruit. If you don't want to be there, they don't want you. They're not going to chase anybody down. They're not going to make anybody do any of this. And um, the guy kills a little girl when he's AWOL. Uh, he's apprehended by the authorities, whoever that is. And the, and the camp commander says, we'll take him. He's ours. Mm-hmm. And they hang him. Yeah. And there's some justifications which are interesting of physical punishment in this book. Mm-hmm. Yep. First of all, they hang him because he's one of theirs and they take care of their own business. There's a sort of a Cosa Nostra <laughs> kind of thing mm-hmm. here that's about honor. But the more interesting th- thing is he says on page 117, he says that Dillinger probably hadn't suffered as much as even the little girl that, that he had killed. But Heinlein writes, I guess in Johnny's voice, suppose it seemed more likely that, that he was so crazy that he had never been aware that he was doing anything wrong. Well, what then? He says, well, we shoot mad dogs, don't we? Yes, but being crazy in that way is a sickness. Johnny says, I couldn't see but two possibilities. Either he could not be made well, in which case he was better dead for his own sake and for the safety of others, or he could be treated and made sane, in which case it seemed to me if he ever became sane enough for civilized society and thought over what he had done while he was sick, what could be left for him but suicide? How could he live with himself? Mm Mm-hmm. For this Dillinger person to live would be worse than for him to be hanged. For society's sake and for Dillinger's sake. Right, because he'll just be worse or he'd have to live with it. It's an interesting take on the death penalty, which I have mixed feelings about. More of my mixed feelings are about who's applying it than about its application. But That's always the problem, right? It's a heck of a thing. But this is the more older idea that you might not hear very much. If he's a genuine psychopath his life isn't good anyway not even to him right that was the old time justifications for this you're doing the guy a favor lest he do more evil what socrates talks about this that the punishment is something you should be thankful for because it prevents you from doing evil things and it's worse to be evil than to be punished You know, that to be an evil person, to be the tyrant is worse than to have somebody put you in jail or, Mm -hmm. you know, flog you or something. That's a better state of affairs than to be the evil person, that it's bad for you. Yeah. How does he formulate that? What is better, to be harmed or to harm? And Socrates says it's better to be harmed than to actually harm people. Yeah. And if you think he's right, then 
with all of my reservations, capital punishment still, it's something you can understand that that's, it's not revenge necessarily. Right. It's prophylactic. You know, it's like, what good is the rabid dog to anybody, even to the dog? Right now, right now, on page 117, you can see Johnny becoming a military man. Mm -hmm. His ideas of justice and action are crystallizing a little uh, more. He goes on to say, he says, you know, let's say we could make the guy sane, but it's going to take a little while. Suppose he escaped before he was cured and did the same thing again, and maybe again. How do you explain that to breathe parents? I couldn't see but one answer. And then he goes on, he has a little flashback to class with Do, uh, Mr. Dubois. Law-abiding people, Dubois had told us, hardly dared go into a public park at night. To do so was at risk, attack by wolf packs of children, armed with chains, knives, homemade guns, bludgeons, to be hurt at least, robbed most certainly, injured for life, probably, or even killed. This went on for years, right up until the war between the Russo-Anglo-American <laughs> alliance and the Chinese hegemony. Murder, drug addiction, larceny, assault, and vandalism were commonplace. Nor were parks the only places. These things happened also on the streets in daylight, on school grounds, even inside school buildings. Parks were so notoriously unsafe that honest people stayed clear of them after dark. I tried to imagine such things happening in our schools. I simply could not, nor in our parks. A park was a place for fun, not for getting hurt. As for, for getting killed in one, Mr. Dubois, didn't they have police or courts? They had many more police than we have, and more courts, all overworked. Johnny says, I, I guess I don't get it. If a boy in our city had done anything half that bad, well, he and his father would have been flogged side by side. But such things just don't happen. Gosh, I think culture is important. We're very nervous to impose on anybody. I get that, but you don't need so many laws if your people are naturally ordered to follow the laws. If you and I have dinner together, we don't need laws saying how much brisket you can take. Or, or a law that says I can't stick you with a fork. Right. Because I trust that you're not going to stick me with a fork. Because <laughs> we share some common values. and Trust but verify, Carl. <laughs> <laughs> I want to keep going just a little bit here. Do, okay. A little later in that conversation, Dubois mused aloud. I do not understand objections to cruel and unusual pr punishment. While a judge should be benevolent in purpose, his awards should cause the criminal to suffer, else there is no punishment. And pain is the basic mechanism built into us by millions of years of evolution, which safeguards us by warning when something threatens our survival. Why should society refuse to use such a highly perfected survival mechanism? And then he says, however, that period was loaded with pre-scientific pseudo-psychological nonsense. <laughs> He's talking about our time. I have lately been thinking about this stuff in some parts of our culture. It's pretty cool to go to prison and get out. Mm -hmm. It's cool. Like, man, you know, that guy's in his joint. And, and people commonly say this sort of a finishing school for criminals. You know, if you want to, you go in some sort of petty criminal and you learn how to do the real crimes uh, when you're in there. And you make connections. And you make connections. And in certain circles, it's a badge of honor to have gone and done hard time. And uh, I don't know if it needs to be cruel or unusual, but it ought to be humiliating and it ought to remove social status instead of in, uh, confer social status. And then how crazy is it that we get, give them the vote? Like felons can vote in certain states at this point. That used to not be the case. Contra this story here. You know, mm, this is hard. The fact that culture wars have in many ways been stupid and pointless does not mean that culture is not important. Mm -hmm. If you don't have one, I think part of the, the difficulties of this early 21st century is searching around to figure out what's the culture. You know, what what do we believe? What There used to be more stability. You used to be able to grow up and say, well, this is the sort of person I'm going to be and have some stable social structures. And we don't really have that much anymore. And we don't have, someday I'm going to have you read McIntyre's book, After Virtue. Mm. We don't really have a, a good grasp of what a virtue is because virtues, even in Aristotle, virtues grow out of a cultural working out of how to live in the city. And if you don't have a common culture, you can't have common virtues. And 
Uh, so I, I, I think that's important, but everyone's going to say, well, whose culture? You know, and that's why the second book is that McIntyre wrote, I think it's called Whose Rationality, Whose Virtue, or something like that, to point out the problems, not to give the solution. But to have a right and wrong, you have to have a common societal view that some things are right and some things are wrong. It can't just all be up for grabs. Yeah. Otherwise, it's all traffic jams and fender benders. Here's a beautiful one-liner. By the way, he's pro-spanking, Carl. I know. I can't get on board with that. I'm all for putting people in the <laughs> pillories in the town square and throwing tomatoes at their face. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not a pro-spanker. If you get to the point with the kid that you need to spank him, you, you've done screwed up sometime before, and uh, I think. But uh, He says, do, uh, again, through Dubois. I think Dubois is Heinlein's conscience in his uh, military and ethical sense. I don't know. But he says, the basis of all morality is duty, a concept with the same relation to group that self-interest has to individual. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So morality here is expanding your your zone of care. Mm -hmm. So the civilian's zone of care might just be himself. I don't know if zone of care is a word, but I just made it one. Okay. I like it. Zone of care. I care about myself, my financial future, and then you expand it to your family. The, my sphere of responsibility is now my family, okay? And you make bigger and bigger groups, and you extend it to your entire political group, your entire nation, maybe your entire species in this world. And that duty is an extension of your care for yourself, except you're counting more people in the self. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? I think that's what he's saying there. And not everybody's going to do it. It's like in the Iliad, not everybody's a hero. Some of them are just, will stay home, but some of them will put themselves on the line for the others. And that's the distinction between the citizen and the civilian in this book. Civilian doesn't have to. It's fine. Go do your stuff. But I have some people that I know that have served in combat zones. I don't don't feel like I have the right to say too much about these sorts of things, but I do like to listen. Like on the socials, I generally don't mute people, just a couple. Who did you mute? <laughs> Name them. <laughs> uh, no, I'm not going to do that. I, not too many, actually. It's not, usually just for 30 days, but not very many because I want to hear what they have to say and, and I'll just listen and they'll they'll talk about politics and, and mostly what they're talking about is American military adventures, and they're they're mostly very reluctant. The ones who have actually done it, what are we doing here? So the movie, the terrible movie, thinks it's some kind of fascist militarism. But these aren't the soldiers themselves that make the policy. You have to be out. Mm -hmm. You have to be out. And the ones that are out, if you know some and you listen to them and say what they think about things, it might be eye-opening for you. It's not, hey, let's go bomb people. It's like, what the hell are we doing? Why are we there? And if action was required, they're all in. They'll be the ones on the front lines should they get called up. But generally, I'm generalizing, generally they don't, they're like, no, why are we there? Why are we doing this? So these guys have this sense of duty. Mm -hmm. And they trust that the the higher ups that make the decision to use force or right, and then they go provide the violence like Highland says. And then when that, once they do it, they're they're loath to talk about it. Like you said, it's certainly with somebody that's not kind of in the brotherhood. Goes back to the story about the private who had struck Zim. The captain, Frankel, and Zim have a conversation that Johnny is able to hear through the wall. Frankel says, Zim, don't you ever let these kids hit you. You get on your toes. They're going to want to. You do not ever give them an opportunity to succeed. They're going to make mistakes, and it's your job to make sure that they never make that mistake. And he gives him, he gives him a talk on the responsibilities of command that is absolutely fantastic. I think at some point, I, I, I didn't highlight it, I should have. He says, you never give them an order that they won't follow. And that's very interesting because you're going to be forced to give people orders that are very difficult to carry out. So the NCO, well, and the officer, is going to have to know where that line is 
where you can ask people to do things they didn't think they could do or didn't think they would do, but yet were willing to attempt. And he says you never put them in a position to actually be insubordinate. So when those higher-ups start making dumb decisions about where and how force are to be used, they're doing terrible things to their military men. Yeah. You know, like if our, if our military said, you know, we're going to Canada and we're, we're going to, you know, kill all the Canadians and unseat Trudeau because they've got Molson, <laughs> that would do irreparable damage to the military. Yeah. Well, there's hardly any Canadians, though. And Molson's not that good. Right. <laughs> That's why the whole thing's bad. The whole enterprise is bad. But to ask them to, do, to make a bad ask is irresponsible and unethical to Captain Frankel and to Zim. Zim knows it. Zim knows that that kid getting la those 10 lashes was his fault. It was not the kid's fault. The kids make mistakes. Zim has to be perfect, and he knows that because he's responsible. Think about it in the business world. What happens if you, you tell somebody in your employ to do something that he won't do? Yeah. Now you have to deprive him of his livelihood. Yeah, you have to fire him or you have to back down, in which case the the order in your company has gone. Yep. So just you, you can't do that. It's up to you to make it so that the things that you want them to do are the things that they want to do. I worked for Homeland Grocery Stores <laughs> when I was 16 years old. And the first week I worked there, I was low man on the totem pole, and you would be a grocery sacker if you were low man and you worked 7 p.m. till midnight. That's what you did. And the 7 p.m. to midnight guy cleaned the bathrooms in the front end. We had bath back bathrooms in the back end that the employees used, and those weren't so bad, but the front end ones could be pretty wacky. And I cleaned the men's bathroom, not a big deal. Didn't enjoy it, but cleaned the men's bathroom. And I opened the door to the women's bathroom, and somebody had detonated on the wall behind the toilet. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> defiled the space. It needed to be ritually burned. <laughs> And I thought, well, I'm going to try. And I spent about 17 seconds trying and was gagging. And I, I, and I said, you know, I'm making 435. I'm not going to do it. I, I, I'm just not going to do this. And I, Mr. Horner was the, the manager. And I went to him. I said, hey, Mr. Horner, somebody, somebody done crapped all over the wall in there. I don't want to tell you no, but I don't, that's, I don't make enough money to do that. And he said, well, let's go look. And we went and looked. And he said, you know what? I'll clean it. Wow. His name was Paul Horner. Years later, I ran into a lady named Louise, and Louise was married to Mike. And uh, that was Paul Horner's brother. And he was also a retail store manager for Atwoods, kind of farm supply stores. And I, I told her that story. Paul was a special guy to have done that. Mm -hmm. And he did, he did many things like that. He was just a store manager at a grocery store. Yeah. Couldn't ask a kid for 435 to go in there and throw up on his shoes. <laughs> I'm just thinking he's a bit like Zim. Yep. Would have done the same thing. It's good leadership. I want to go back to page 93. <laughs> we're never going to get done with this. No, it's such a good book. You know, we're just going to abandon it pretty soon. Look, dear listener, you're never done with a good book. You're never done with a great book. Because it's never done with you. You're just moving on from it for a while. And then you'll probably come back to it. This is a pretty good book. It's pretty good. It's pretty good. I've read it like five times. Johnny is thinking of quitting. He's thinking of slinking back home and going to Harvard. I love that line. <laughs> and uh, he's just, he's, he's got to get over the hump and he's not over the hump and everything feels bad. And then he gets a letter from Mr. Dubois, a turning point. My dear boy, th this professor who had just yelled at him the whole time, I would have written to you much sooner to express my delight and my pride in learning that you'd not only volunteered to serve, but had also chosen my own service. But not to express surprise, it's what I expected of you. Could have fooled him, right? Yeah, he thought he hated him. <laughs> thought he hated me. So the history of military, what is it, history and moral philosophy class, honestly, Reminds me, I said this on our Slack channel, reminds me of family dinners in my house. If you made any, when I was growing up, if you made any sort of a moral claim, my dad, who's pretty sharp, and my brothers, who are pretty sharp, I'm sharper, 
they'll never listen to this because it's me. I can say that. But you had to defend it, you know? And Dubois like like handing out master's theses, you know? If you think this is true, tell me why. Well, what about this? Well, what about Genghis Khan and the Mongol invasion? What? You know, geez, dad, <laughs> just making conversation. No, you have to defend it. You, you're not just allowed to be a sloppy thinker. In my house, much to the annoyance of my mother, you were not allowed to be a sloppy thinker because you had some ravening wolves sitting at the table ready to tear you apart. But it was good. It was good. And this is what Dubois done. And, and Rico thought the whole time he hated him. But no, the point was to get him to be, you know, the best that he could be. And he sends in this letter. You are now going through the hardest part of your service, not the hardest physically. The physical hardship will never trouble you again. You now have its measure. I love that part. But the hardest spiritually, the deep soul turning readjustments and reevaluations necessary to metamorphosize, metamorphize a potential citizen into one in being. I want to go down a paragraph. When you've reached that spiritual mountaintop, you felt something and knew something. Perhaps you haven't words for it. I know I didn't when I was a boot. So perhaps you'll permit an older comrade to lend you the words, since it often helps to have discreet words. Simply this. The noblest fate that a man can endure is to place his own mortal body between his loved home and the war's desolation. The words are not mine, of course, as you will recognize. Basic truths cannot change, and once a man of insight expresses one of them, it is never necessary, no matter how much the world changes, to reformulate them. Uh, this is an immutable true everywhere throughout all time for all men and all nations. Uh, he says, he concludes the letter, if you happen to run across any of my former mates, give them my warmest greetings. Good luck, trooper, you've made me proud. Jean Dubois, Lieutenant Colonel, Mobile Infantry, retired. So the guy who is teaching him his high school moral philosophy class is a a uh, war hero of some note. Zim is very impressed when he finds out that he got this letter. The noblest fate that a man can endure is to place his own mortal body between his loved home and the war's desolation. That's it. That's citizenship. That's yeah. uh, There are people that will do that, and then there's a whole lot of people that will not. And so the question of the book is, who should have the sovereign power? And then the war stories, because there are war stories, there's shoot 'em up stuff in here. Mm -hmm. There's tales of heroism and fear and all of that stuff are really about what's a proper cost to be a citizen. To be a citizen requires certain things. You need to understand the use of force and you need to be willing to place your own mortal body between your loved home and the war's desolation, all of those things. But you also need to pay. You need to do. And I think that the stories are really about, you know, paying. Yeah, that was really challenging to me when we did. I have gone through with group three. I don't know. Cicero's work on the Republic and on friendship. Mm. You know, a lot of us are pretty cynical about politics. A lot of us in the seminars, me included. And Cicero's like, you can't be. You can't be, you have to get in the arena. You have to do it. If you don't do it, there'll be worse people. The fact that it's corrupt and awful is all the more reason. Hmm. It's very challenging for me because all my inclination is, I don't want to take part in any of this. There are things that bug me about the stuff that we read and, and Cicero's claims and, and Highland's claims about the requirements of citizenship bug me because I'd rather just let everybody else do it and me just watch the place burn. But it's challenging, right? What does it mean to, you know, one of my least favorite dialogues of Plato. I have one that I hate. It's the Crito, Crito. I hate no. that one. Because there's Socrates. Socrates is one of my best friends, even though I never met him. He's been dead for 2,400 years. He's one of my best friends. And I don't like that they killed him. And I don't like that he stayed and let them do it. And it bugs me. Every time I read the Phaedo, I'm I'm getting choked up in the middle of it in the end. Gosh, the end. But he makes this point in the Credo. You know, Socrates was a soldier who put his life on the line for his city and took the punishment that the city decreed for him to take because it was the sovereign power. By him drinking the hemlock, he's putting his mortal body between his loved home and war's desolation. You know, rather than 
saying, no, I didn't mean it. It bugs me because I don't want it to be right. Right. And those are the points. The points where you want to throw a book across the room, uh, it doesn't mean that it's right, the book, but it means that that's the point that you need to consider. It's rubbing up on something in your character. And and this book and Credo and that Cicero thing. That Cicero thing. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's kind of cool to poop on politics and say they're all horrible, they're all awful, and want a bunch of morons and, and kind of sit off in, in the uh, non-committed zone. Well, but if you do that, you're leaving, you're leaving that to the criminals and bad people. I would say that Dubois would say that retreat is not the proper answer. Mm -hmm. And that's a challenge to me. Don't you wish all of our seminars were as good as the history of moral philosophy? <laughs> he says, um, history of moral philosophy works like a delayed action bomb. You wake up in the middle of the night and think, well, what do you mean by that? <laughs> he says, um, uh, Dubois asks Mr. Solomon, he says, can you give me a reason, not historical nor theoretical, but practical, why the franchise is today limited to discharged vet veterans? And he makes these kids answer these questions. Um, and he abuses them all to the point that they, none of them think that they, <laughs> he likes them. <laughs> but the Federation is at war with the bugs. It's an alien race that share something with ants and spiders somehow. They kind of, they're spider looking. He never really describes them very much, but he says they're kind of spidery looking and they live below the surface of whatever planets they're on. And they have brains. There's a caste system. They've got workers and they've got warriors and then they have brains and then they have queens and they live below the surface of the earth. Workers won't fight. So if you get shot out of a tube in your capsule and you land on the surface of a planet that is inhabited by the bugs, you're going to encounter a bunch of workers and they don't do anything and you shouldn't waste your ammo on those. But the warriors, very strong, clever soldiers, and uh, very aggressive. You're going to have to kill them. But they have a lot of trouble in defeating these bugs because they're communists. Right? <laughs> they're communists. The workers and the warriors have no thought for themselves. They act on orders to the nth degree. The warriors have to be killed. You can cut all their arms off, and they're still trying to bite you as they wiggle around on the ground. They have no sense of self. They have no self-preservation instinct whatsoever. For me, this is some of the science fiction stuff that's in it. The aliens are kind of alien. It's the red threat, though, Carl. Come on. Well, sure. But the problem with the red threat is they're actually humans on the other end, which is why right. the wall came down. There used to be a wall in Berlin. It came down. It worked for a while. But if the goal, as I think Dubois says earlier, if the goal is to make the enemy not fight, it's not just violence for its own sake. Well, how do you get a hive mind enemy not to fight? None of the things that you do to the warriors or even to the workers affects the royalty. The Politburo. Yeah. You know, Russia won World War II. The Soviets won World War II. Stalin didn't seem to care much if 20 million people died doing it. It didn't affect him. If any of the listeners have gone through the Ender's Game plague seminars, I think Orson Scott Card is, uh, this is, mm -hmm. this is, uh, I don't want to spoil it for you, but it's Starship Troopers from the point of view of the queen, of the aliens. Which is an interesting idea. You know, we think... When we watch these movies, if you watch Star Trek, every single alien race in Star Trek is just humans with a thing on his face. <laughs> a thing on his face. The Cardassians, or, which aren't the Cardassians, but the Cardassians right. in Deep Space Nine, they just got a little thing on the bridge of the nose or Betazoids, whatever they were. My, my aunt is a big, big tricky. But they all act human with human motivations. So it's not really aliens. Real aliens would be alien and you wouldn't necessarily know how they thought yeah which is the problem they're having in starship troopers so that's that's a bit of of pretty good science fiction thinking here that rationality and the thinking of the individual like they make this point uh, a few times mobile infantry goes back to get their dead they don't leave you there but what if it takes three or four lives to get back the body of the one doesn't matter they go back and get them okay uh, so for humans, at least for humans in this world, 
individuality is very important and the value of the individual is very important. Even so that we're going to expend lives to get your dead body off of Klendathu, the alien planet. I have to repeat what you said. Individuality is important. And as a result of that, or as a corollary to that, individuals are important. Yeah. I think that's important. Everybody's like, wants to let their freak flag fly now. <laughs> but then they act like specific individual people don't matter. And it can't be both. Mm-hmm. Dang it. <laughs> I saw a map of a hot zone map of the places in the country where people say dang. Uh-huh. Pretty hot right where you are. <laughs> Not so many people in Illinois say dang. Oh, really? What do y'all say? Darn? <laughs> yeah, or worse. Yeah, yeah. Well, we got worse, too. <laughs> uh, but so if you have aliens that don't, or, you know, this is written in the height of the Cold War, if you have... uh opposition political systems where the individual's not valued, then, you know, there are things you could do to get Americans not to fight, at least Americans in, what is it, 58? This is before Vietnam. There's things that you can do to get Americans not to fight that you can't do to get Stalin, uh, Stalin Soviet Russia not to fight. You know, Cronkite talking about the casualties isn't going to get Stalin to quit. Right. If that's what war is, is attempting to get your enemy not to fight, you need to understand the enemy which is interesting. They, I'm going to say parachute. That's not what they do. They jump into, they're shot onto planet P at one point. And well, well, what they had been doing is they'll find these holes in the ground where the bugs are coming up out of these holes. And they'll, uh, they'll throw a, a, a can of raid down in that hole <laughs> and then they'll dynamite the opening and kill them all. And they're, and they're told they're given strict orders to not do that. Uh, planet P was a field test to determine whether we could learn how to root them out because they want to root some of these this royalty out, the queens and the brains, and they want to see if they can do some prisoner exchanges. They want to learn something about the psychology of their foe, and they need some ca- some prisoners to do that, and they hadn't gotten any prisoners. When I read this about Planet P and about this pilot program to kind of fi- to figure this stuff out, I thought about, oh, this is like uh, Iwo Jima and... Uh, uh, Okinawa, you know, where they're trying to, you know, like, what's it going to be like if we have to actually take the, the Japanese homeland, you know, really dark, nasty stuff, man. Mm-hmm. I don't know that I want to reveal any of the spoilers at the end. Let them read it and have some fun. It's a great book. That's so much fun. I, I, I've enjoyed reading it over and over again. And I don't know that it's confirmation bias because, you know, in this world, I'm not a citizen. I never did it, but it's a challenge, right? So as we get into this election season, I know that's everybody's reaction, right? It's so gross and messy and there's so much garbage propaganda. You can go listen to our earlier show on Edward Bernays or um, the medium is the massage. There's so much of that stuff out there and that stuff works really well on people who don't take their voting very seriously. Who are, you know, just happy because the candidate is part of their little social group. Hooray, a candidate looks like me. Whatever. Who cares, right? Right. For me, this book is a challenge to take it seriously and realize that I hold a sovereign power, even if it's just like one, how many people in Illinois? One thirty millionth of the votes of the state of Illinois but it's sovereign power and the sovereign, whoever it is. And I guess in this case, it's me needs to take some responsibility and exercise this right properly. It's not just a right. It's a duty, even though I hate it and I don't want to do it. I don't want to go through the list of judges. I don't want to know whom I vote for, for the cook County water commissioner, but I guess I better. And wouldn't it be nice if the people in the government treated your citizenship the same way you just described your approach should be. So that when you voted, they actually did what the vote said it should be. Mm -hmm. Like the people of England, the United Kingdom, voted to leave the European Union, and then the government promptly ignored that vote for almost three years. Yeah. That's dangerous stuff. Well, uh, political organizations are much more fragile than people think they are. And they look like they're going to last forever until about a day before they don't. 
Right. And then everybody could see it coming, but nobody sees it coming until it happens. Um, I, it, and, and doing that sort of thing where you have a clearly expressed will of the people and then a clearly expressed will of the governments not to do it. That's how that sort of thing happens. I remember the Soviet Union is going to be forever. They were going to bury us. Mm-hmm. I'm old. I remember it. And then, like, in a weekend, it was gone. And whether the Russian Federation is much of improvement, that's not an issue. The fact is the Soviet Union has gone. It's a fact. Yeah. Yep. And we never saw it coming. Collapse is slow until it's fast. Yeah. I, this is a very good book. The movie, if you do read it, you might go watch the movie and just throw things at the screen and see ex- how they got it 100% completely wrong. So wrong they had to do it on purpose. <laughs> yeah, I hate that. If Heinlein were still alive, he died in 1988, I think. If he were still alive when they made that movie, uh, I think he would have uh, sent a sternly worded letter. So here, let's talk. We've read Bernays' Propaganda and uh, McLuhan, and we've read The Sophist. Did they do a hit piece on that book? Absolutely. Do you think they created a shitty movie to discredit the book, to uh, discourage people from picking it up? Well, maybe it's a, maybe the ideas in the book are so dangerous that you have to make a crappy movie so that nobody will read it. I suspect. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know what you do when somebody, when you find out a book is dangerous? What do you do? You go read it. (laughs) Right. You go find a copy and you read it. At least I do. Yeah. Oh, gosh. We've talked about this for a long time. I, I could keep talking about it. I think it's a great deal of fun. There's whatever you want is in here. If you want the pew pew shoot 'em up stuff, it's there. If you like the uh, full metal jacket sort of uh, boot camp stories, they're in here. Uh, the philosophy there and political theory is there. It's all there. Heinlein's a smart cookie. I think my favorite Heinlein book is uh, The Moon is a Harsh Mistress. Mm-hmm. But I would need to hit that again now that I've read this one. What do you say? Is this your favorite, Heinlein? Yeah, this is my favorite. Next week, well, G.K. Chesterton? Yeah, uh, I think the title's What I Saw in America. Yeah. He took a lecture tour around the United States, and this, I think, is going to be Hambrick's first Chesterton? Yeah, I think that's right. And he's a lot of fun. I'm I'm looking forward to seeing what you make of it. I think I'm in love. Yeah? Maybe. We'll see. <laughs> we'll find out. Ah, well, there's another online great books podcast. Please send a copy of this. A copy? Sure. No. Put it on a, a, a cassette, an eight track cassette, and hand it to your cousin who still has the truck with the eight track player. Mm. I tell you, Carl, I've been wanting to do, I think I may have said this, I've been wanting to do a show about conspiracy theories <laughs> on shortwave radio at like midnight GMT zero. <laughs> And then we'll sell cassette tapes of the recordings, but you have to send like paper money to a P.O. box. A self-addressed stamped. Yeah. Maybe recordings done on a wire recorder or cassettes. <laughs> is that is that too hipster? <laughs> well, it's been done. It's been a while. It's yeah. Again. Art Bell, may he rest in peace. Yeah. Well, did he do shortwave? I don't know if he ever did. My, he missed a good chance. If he that did. show was a lot of fun. Oh, so much fun. I was listening one night. Guys, well, if you have Sonos, you can just type in Art Bell, and you can find old Art Bell radio shows on there. He had a show called Coast to Coast, and I remember laying in bed one time, and somebody, Jim, west of the Rockies, you're like, you know, and the guy came on, and he's like, there's a hole in my backyard, Art. <laughs> and, uh, and, they, and, he, and they did like 30 minutes with this guy, and the guy was like, it's a bottomless hole. <laughs> it's, it's a bottomless hole. Uh, I threw a refrigerator in there, and we dropped an El Camino in it, and I would never heard of it. I know it just went on for it. it Art Bell's just a hundred percent serious, you know, talk, uh, asking about how he'd investigated it with the thing, and what his plans were for the hole, where he thought it, how it, how he thought it had appeared. Well, it must be real, right? Right. Somewhere out in Colorado, west of the Rockies, right? There's a bottomless <laughs> hole. <laughs> and I just I just laid there enthralled. It was on 1170 a, a, uh, a.m. Uh, <laughs> uh, from midnight to like 3 a.m. Uh, it was so much fun. Mm-hmm. Anyway, there's our show. Uh, go send a link to it. It's not as good as Art Bell's, but I'm pretty proud of it. And uh, we'll talk to you guys next Thursday. Thursday.